the final part of my lesson for section 6.2, I want to talk about a theorem that gets discussed here. Uh, specifically, Forrester calls this the fundamental theorem of calculus, derivative of an integral form. Um, we already have a fundamental theorem of calculus. Basically, he tells us that if we uh, want to find the definite integral between two boundary values, we can take the antiderivative and we can take the difference of that antiderivative uh, at each of those two boundary values. Um, so, you know, basically uh, f of a minus f of b after you've taken the, the antiderivative, and that's going to give you your area under the curve, bounded by the curve in the x-axis. Um, so this is another version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's a little different take on it. Uh, specifically, what's happening with this is we're going to be looking at situations where you have a function that is an integral function. Okay, it's a function that has an integral in it. Usually we'll have a variable as well. And you're taking the derivative of that integral function. Okay, so if you just think in general terms, if I take a derivative of an integral, and you think about the relationships between the derivatives and integrals, you can probably come up with a pretty good guess as to what's gonna happen there. Uh, so I'm gonna show you where the pattern comes from and it's a very simple pattern that, that actually comes out of this. Uh, by the way, in a lot of textbooks, this is referred to as the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, so what I'm going to be looking at in this situation, uh, I'm going to be trying to find g prime if I have some function g that is an integral from some constant value to some variable value of a function. Uh, notice that this function is in terms of t. It's in terms of a different variable than this function is over here. And you're going to see how that works in just a second. Um, so what's going on here? Well, technically you can go through this entire problem, okay? And you will see the relationship. Uh, but it is a pretty simple pattern. and You really don't need to go through this set of steps every single time. But I, I will go through it in this example. Uh, you can actually say, I'm going to evaluate function g. I'm going to go in here and I'm going to take the antiderivative and I'm going to do some substitutions and I'm going to figure out what happens here. And you could say, well, uh, the antiderivative of 1 over t is the natural log of the absolute value of t, uh, technically plus c, but I'm going to be substituting in bounds. And I'm going to evaluate that between x and 1. Okay? Uh, so this is another way of writing function g. Well, I haven't really simplified this yet, so I'm going to simplify this down some. I'm going to write function g uh, turns out to be just uh, ln of x, uh, technically ln of the absolute value of x, minus the ln of 1. And of course, 1 is positive already, so I don't really need that. Okay? Now keep in mind, I was not asked to find the value of, of function g, okay? I was told function g in the first place, okay? I, I wrote it in a different form, but that's still the same function, okay? So I can substitute various values of x in here, and we can find out what function g is equal to. But I was asked for the value of g prime, okay? The derivative of that integral function. Well, what happens when I take the derivative here? The derivative of this function is just going to be 1 over x, and, uh, and then the derivative of the natural log function is just going to be 0. And so what I end up finding out here is, if you notice what takes place, I'm taking a derivative of an integral. More or less you can think about the derivative and the integral, the derivative and the integral canceling each other out. Uh, notice though this was written in, in terms of x, uh, this was written in terms of t. My derivative function will be written in terms of x as well. But in a sense, you can think about the derivative canceling out the integral. And as a result, I get something that looks like the inside function just written in terms of that variable. Okay? Um, so this results in some pretty simple relationships here. Uh, for example, uh, if I'm told that function g is equal to, uh, let's say, cosine of x, uh, the integral from, and, and by the way, the constant value doesn't matter. The constant value can be whatever you want it to. It can be 4 uh, 2x. And let's say it's the integral of cosine of t dt, and I want to find g prime of x. Again, your gut instinct is, 
well, the original function is an integral. I want to find a derivative of an integral. Those two things are opposites of each other, so it seems like those two things would cancel out. And, you know, your, your thought is, well, you know, wouldn't that just be then that the derivative cancels this out and it leaves you with just cosine of x? You know, that's, that's your question. Is that all the answer is going to be? Um, and it turns out, yeah, that is actually going to be the answer. Again, do you need to show the steps that I'm getting ready to show every time? No, but if you need to, you can go through the process. So if I wanted to go through the process, I could come up here and say, okay, I'm going to take the antiderivative. That's sine of t, and I'm going to evaluate it between x and 4. Okay, what's that going to give me? Well, it's going to tell me that function g is equal to sine of x minus sine of 4. Again, wasn't trying to find g of x. All I did at this point is write g in a different form. I'm trying to find g prime. I'm trying to find the derivative. Well, what happens? The derivative of sine is cosine of x. That's a constant. Derivative is zero. It's gone. There is my derivative. Okay? So the point being, if you take the derivative of an integral, they end up canceling each other out, and whatever this variable is, you're going to end up with that same function written in terms of whatever variable you have written there in, in your integral function. Okay, that's what the second fundamental theorem of calculus says. Essentially that an integral and a derivative cancel each other out. Now there are lots of different ways of looking at this. We're just kind of entering this idea. But that's what you're going to see on the core. Now, one thing you do have to watch out for. Uh, every time I've done this so far, we've noticed that the constant ends up canceling later. So that does not matter. It can be 1, it can be 0, it can be 47. You're not going to see it show up in the final answer. However, I've used an x in this position in both cases. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do exactly the same problem, except I'm going to do it with an x squared instead. And you are going to see one slight issue that comes into play here. Let's say that g of x was equal to the integral from 1 to x squared of cosine of t dt. And I wanted to find g prime, all right? Well, based on what we've seen before, it seems like it's just going to be the derivative of an integral knocks out the integral. It seems like it's just going to be the integral, uh, it, it seems like it's just going to be this function with this variable. So your guess is, you know, maybe it's going to be cosine of, of x squared. Seems like that's what would happen. Derivative and the integral cancel each other out. We're just left with this in terms of that variable. Well, let me go through the steps here, and, and this is why, if you ever need to, you can always go through these actual steps. Uh, so what happens here is, I take the antiderivative. The antiderivative is sine of t, okay? It's evaluated, this is function g, it's being evaluated between 1 and x squared, okay? So what do I get? I find out that function g could be written as sine of x squared minus sine of 1. Then I take the derivative of that function, because remember, I was asked to find g prime, not g. And this is where things get a little bit interesting, because yes, I get a cosine of x squared, like I expected to get up here, except there's an inside function. Chain rule says I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function, and I'm going to have a 2x out in front. Okay. Meanwhile, sine of 1, that's a constant. Uh, the derivative of that, of course, is just zero, and it cancels out. Uh, so I actually end up with g prime equaling 2x times the cosine of x squared. Uh, point being, you do have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function of that variable. Uh, but in general, the second th fundamental theorem of calculus is going to let you cancel out an integral with the derivative. Um, you just have to watch out that there's not a derivative of an inside function that you have to multiply. So that's the idea. Again, Forrester uses a different term. Uh, he just calls this the fundamental theorem of algebra, derivative of an integral form. So different names, all the same thing, though.